Okay, in this lecture, I'd like to talk about fracture and ceramics. Which are materials that are known to have high strength and low ductility. which means that we're going to have brittle fracture because we do not have a lot of plasticity in front of the crack tip. So like brittle fracture in metals, we're going to have a smooth, cleavage and uh, intergranular cracking. Sorry, not inter, intra. So if you have a uh, a uh, microstructure uh, intragranular crack cracking means that as you have a crack and it propagates, it's going to tend to just continue to, to propagate without. Uh, paying attention to the grain boundaries. You may have some deflection, but it's not a, a lot. Uh, now, we can modify that. And some of these modifications can help uh, improve the, the issue of inter, intragranular cracking, uh, for example, we can add uh, fiber reinforcement. And this fiber reinforcement is going to assist in crack deflection. Which increases the surface area. which means that's an outlet for energy consumption. So when we have this elastic energy, it has to go somewhere and it can go uh, in the creation of surface area or it can go into, uh, you know, well, it really is gonna be the a bail the uh, a balance between uh, surface area and elastic energy. But if we can uh, get deflection due to introducing uh, uh, fiber materials or platelet materials, uh, that's going to reduce the total uh, crack uh, propagation distance because instead of going straight through, you're going to wind up with cracks that have to uh, move around and deflect. Uh, this also assists in crack bridging. Meaning that you'll have fibers that span across the crack length, uh, basically holding the crack together. And we'll, we can talk more about that in, in uh, uh, later if we have time to talk about uh, composites. Uh, other modifications to ceramics that we can add that will uh, improve the uh, crack performance is we can uh, eliminate uh, surface defects and inclusions.
to uh, reduce uh, crack initiation points. Now, having said that, uh, another uh, method to improve the performance is to actually uh, uh, introduce microcracking ahead of the tip. And that would be through the addition of a, another phase in, in which you'll have some material and you have some second phase here such that as a crack comes forward, if it encounters the second phase, it's going to deflect the, the crack. So th these two concepts are, are in, in many ways uh, counter to each other. Uh, and it de really depends on the class of material that you're, you're working with uh, and how these trade-offs play out. And, and lastly, uh, we can include phase transformations called phase transformation materials that uh, that uh, arrest crack propagation. And the, the best example of that is partially stabilized zirconia, uh, PZT, wait. Sorry, PSZ, Jim to Christmas, PSZ. And then oftentimes it also contains uh, around 3% uh, yttria. to perform the stabilization. Uh, and the idea is that uh, zirconium oxide has um, multiple phases available. And you can stabilize one of the high temperature phases through the addition of yttria, uh, magnesium, and, and other, other uh, additives. So we'll have a, a tetragonal phase. That's stabilized. And typically, you'll have to have uh, some type of uh, uh, hot isostatic pressing or, or hot pressing that allows you to uh, stabilize this as well in the processing step. And if you have this uh, as a crack uh, propagates, the uh, stress field uh, ahead of the crack tip will induce uh, a transformation. To the uh, low temperature, a monoclinic phase. And when that happens, that results in an increase in volume and uh, the addition of a shear stress.
And what that does is it essentially forces this crack tip to close. So this uh, partially stabilized zirconia, this is the type of thing that you see when you have you know, these ceramic knives And Coors made a, a ceramic hammer for a while. Uh, you don't need just uh, uh, partially stabilized zirconia. This is also sometimes performed with uh, AL203 plus uh, partially stabilized zirconia. You'll put those, those two components together in which the AL203 would be the, the parent phase. Uh, talking about the geometry of these cracks, if you have your surface. Or you'll have some surface defect. Which is something that, you know, of course, you want to minimize, uh, but nonetheless, you, you can't be perfect. Uh, and oftentimes these surface defects that come about from environmental considerations, for example, uh, water uh, corrodes uh, silica, SiO2. So the exposure to water will naturally introduce these defects in, in uh, glasses. So as time goes, glasses that don't have coated surfaces will develop these uh, surface cracks uh, we'll wind up with an initial crack, which is fairly smooth, uh, you know, almost cleavage-like, and this is called the, the mirror region. This will then start to deflect and uh, will have some shape to it, and then it will uh, start to bifurcate. as it propagates. This region is called the mist region. And this region is called the hackle. Uh, this bifurcation is, is due to uh, these fine cracks encountering defects and flaws. Now, these flaws come about from uh, three uh, routes, processing defects, uh, design defects, and uh, surface, or a uh, service. Uh, design flaws and uh, produced. So talking about processing defects, uh, these can be inclusions, uh, thermal stresses, So we know that these ceramics have to be processed at high temperature and upon cooling, you can introduce uh, defects and micro cracks due to thermal processing. Uh, there can also be surface defects due to machining. In terms of design flaws, this has to do with the macroscopic design. Uh, you know, for example, the introduction of notches, uh, holes and stress couples And you know, I, I had a, a coffee mug in college that I, I really liked, and you know, it, it broke you know, kind of within the first year I had it. And you know, looking at it, uh, it was a, a slip cast mug, but uh, it was really designed to, to have a, a, a
stress concentrator right where the handle connected to that mug. A little steam coming out my coffee there. Uh, and that stress concentrator uh, resulted in a fairly short uh, service lifetime for, for that coffee mug. Uh, and then uh, service produced. Well, you can have uh, damage due to pitting or uh, impact. You have this on your uh, the windshield of your car. Uh, I had the windshield of my car replaced after about uh, 25 years because the whole surface was scratched up from just uh, surface erosion. Uh, same thing as scratches. And uh, you can also have environmental damage. And I, I mentioned water here. And it's one of the things you don't really think about, but uh, water really is a, is a big problem for uh, silica-based uh, ceramics. So let's talk about uh, impact of grain size. Well, grain size effects, uh, as you can imagine, they're present uh, and, and they come about from our understanding of uh, fracture mechanics. If you remember from MSE 201, you've got your K1C, which goes as sigma pi over A, which means that sigma is equal to K1C over square root of pi a is equal to k1c over square root pi, I'm going to call this d over 2. And basically we're saying here that if you have a uh, microstructure, the largest allowed crack is d over 2. And if you get larger than that, it's just going to naturally propagate across the, across the surface which that tells us that our uh, yield, uh, well, let's call it our, our critical uh, stress is going to be proportional to D to the minus one half. But again, this is not a particularly uh, deep or insightful statement. This is just uh, you know, linear elastic fracture mechanics. Now, things that are unique to ceramics uh, are uh, viable statistics. And this is a, let's call this a tensile loading, tensile So this is kind of ceramics in their worst uh, case. Uh, viable statistics are the statistics of the probability sur of survival of a given volume. These are basically uh, statistics looking at the probability of finding a defect large enough for failure. Volume a defect large enough for failure. At uh, stress sigma. So an expression for viable statistics is this. Okay. So viable statistics 
these are our statements that uh, the strength is determined by the largest flaw. in volume V. And you kind of have the in intuition for this because you know you, you imagine to yourself uh, you know, a person dropping a, 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 a small sheet of glass and a large sheet of glass. And you know, in part, your, your intuition is being guided by you know, thinking about momentum, thinking about uh, the, the the mass, but it's also being guided by your intuition about larger pieces of glass tend to be more fragile. And that's because there's a higher probability that somewhere in that volume, you're going to encounter a volume that's critical for a, a given loading. So this is the probability of uh, survival uh, I told you V is your volume and Sigma is your stress uh, V naught and Sigma naught are normalization terms Right, you need that because, of course, you have an exponent here. Uh, so interior has to be uh, dimensionless. And, and basically, you're, you're talking about uh, your volume as a uh, function of a normalized volume containing a distribution of defects. Oops. This uh, sigma u. That's a uh, material constraint. And we're saying that if sigma is less than or equal to sigma u, then P V is approximately zero. So it's giving us the, uh, I guess a critical stress at which point it, the, the material spontaneously uh, 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 ruptures. And lastly, this M, that M tells us about the distribution of flaws. It's called the, uh, the, viable, uh, the viable modulus. If M is large, then the distribution of flaws is small. And M small flaw distribution, large. And really, if we're thinking about it, then we're talking about uh, this versus this. M try making this a little nicer. that. 
And naturally, if you have something out here, you're going to have a material that is more susceptible to damage, particularly as you start sampling a larger volume of space. So this viable modulus tells us about that distribution. And there's kind of a, a, a neat uh, uh, test you can do uh, looking at as a, the surface distribution of flaws uh, using uh, using uh, glass slides. So if you take glass slides from uh, from you know the, the type of things you have in biology class where you are putting drops of samples and having a, a, a microscope that uh, projects light through the slide. If you have these, you have a natural distribution of flaws on these surfaces. And these flaws are due to uh, interaction with uh, water in the environment and being stored uh, for you know years on a shelf. Uh, but if you take and you uh, use hydrogen fluoride to wash the surface, and you're basically now taking your uh, surface and are uh, polishing off, just that top surface layer, you are uh, transforming the distribution of flaws on the surface. And if you break, you know, 20 slides before uh, washing and 20 slides that have been washed, you can uh, plot these and you can see a, a definite shift in the, the viable modulus. And that tells you that there's a, a change in the uh, population of uh, defects. So this is kind of the way to think about brittle fracture in you know your kind of your standard loading situation. Uh, compression is different. And compression failure is different because, well, why should it fail, right? Because if we think about linear elastic fracture mechanics, uh, is there a reason that a crack's kind of open if you're squishing them together? Uh, and in fact, if you look at the mode of failure, uh, assuming that again, you have your, your surfaces uh, well lubricated so you don't have surface sticking, and we talked about this uh, barreling before, uh, what you observe is actual splitting in which you get cracks that erupt parallel to the direction of applied loading. And this is, uh, uh, again, something that we have to consider coming from pre-existing cracks, because we're, we're not really nucleating new, no, new cracks. But now these pre-existing cracks are being compressed. And uh, the hypothesis, which there's evidence that this is, is uh, correct, is, is, is that if you have some type of uh, crack internal or, or on the surface, as you are applying these under compression, these get closed. 
and once they're closed, they are able to slide past each other. And that sliding will allow the creation of these wing cracks that are going to open up and are going to run actually in the direction of compressing lo compressive loading. An observation is that these wing cracks will tend to come up like this. They'll tend to wing up like this. And the uh, initial angle whoop my mistake. is 70 degrees, and then it'll come back in straight like that. So It's going to be in the direction of maximum compressive stress. And the, uh, the criteria. Uh, I'm not going to derive here, uh, but you can see this in page uh, 503 of Meyer and uh, Chihuahua. The uh, proposed modes then are a, a threefold. Uh, one uh, is a pr proposed mode in which you have a part. It has its internal or surface flaws. You apply a compressive uh, stress, and that leads to axial splitting. So you'll have a stress versus strain curve that is up, and you have this fracture. But you can have other modes. For example, you can apply compressive stresses in other directions as well. So for example, if I have compressive loading, but then I also have actual uh, long lateral loading in compression. There's two pathways that this can take. One, uh, you can have uh, your lateral uh, less than your compressive. 
and uh, substantially less than your compressive. And uh, you can wind up with uh, shear cracking in kind of shear bands of sorts in which these will combine together not in the uh, actual splitting type mechanism, but in directions that are consistent with uh, shear cracking. And, and you can think of that as uh, in directions uh, dependent upon like a, a Schmid factor type loading, except now it's not dislocations, but instead it's, it's a, a combination of micro cracks that, that come together. So it, it really is still a stochastic process. And in that, you'd have stress versus strain. You'd have some, some uh, failure. If, however, uh, your lateral loading is uh, getting close to the compressive loading, uh, now you will see uh, internal uh, crack behavior in which the, the, the cracks will be uh, confined And the behavior will be, I guess, kind of pseudoplastic so long as the uh, uh, loading is maintained. So you'll have uh, these cracks interacting with each other, but uh, they're maintained by the external loading. And, and lastly, talking about ceramics, uh, we need to talk about uh, thermally induced fracture. And then this is because ceramics are high temperature materials. And, and what's more, uh, many ceramics are uh, highly anisotropic. It's not common to find, you know, FCC or uh, BCC crystals. In fact, it's much more common to find a monoclinic tetragonal and uh, hexagonal or rhombohedral crystals. And in that case, you can have a fairly significant difference in the uh, A and the C axis and having a, a polycrystalline material means that you can have a uh, thermal coefficient of expansion of C and A that are uh, sufficiently different that processing results in uh, stresses at the, the grain boundaries that can yield uh, crack initiation. So um, 
thermal coefficient of expansion. Transitioning from temperature one to temperature two, you got the Young's modulus. DT, or stress that goes as, assuming that the thermal coefficient of expansion is independent of temperature, which it approximately is, delta T. And then of course, remembering that from linear elastic fracture mechanics, pi A. So that's going to be from uh, your grain size and uh, grain boundaries. This is going to be your applied stresses. And in this case, it will be uh, coming from your thermal cycling. And uh, that's all I want to say about uh, uh, ceramics. This is an overview. It's something that uh, ceramics themselves are, are a fascinating topic you can spend years studying. But uh, for this class, I think we're going to stop here.